So how good is a wine that's almost perfection? One of the most divisive topics in wine is a 100 point scale. It was the scale that was made famous by the infamous critic Robert Parker. In the US that scale took off because it was easy to understand. Grades in school are also based on the 100 point mark where above 90 points you're getting an A, above 80 points you're getting a B. Actually the scale starts at 50 because 50 is technically the lowest score you can get. A lot of people joke it's really a 15 point scale, 85 point points and above, but I would say it's almost more like a 10 point scale these days. If a wine doesn't get 90 points, it's almost deemed a failure, which I don't really love. I'd like to see more of the scale utilized. Back in the day before I was really working in wine, I didn't really understand wine that well. It seemed like a wine that was getting 99, 100 points and it almost had something special inside. In essence, scores are just a critic's opinion of a wine. That being said, I don't think scores are an end all be all that's a snapshot of a moment in time. However, I want to see scores versus not seeing scores because it shows that somebody put their opinion on the line. As I get more and more into wine professionally, one thing that I do realize is the people's opinions that carry the most weight, they usually have context. They taste thousands and thousands of wines per year. All the great wines, they've tasted many verticals of it. They have context about where the wine's going, whereas the casual wine drinker doesn't. With the elevation and inflation of scores, a 99 point score doesn't carry as much weight as it used to. However, technically it's almost a perfect wine in the eyes of that wine critic. What throws people off is usually age-worthy wines, especially age-worthy red wines get high scores in their youth. They don't show as well as they will with time in the bottle. I have two red wines here that both scored 99 points. One by your favorite critic James Suckling and the other one by Jeb Dunnick. James Suckling was at Wine Spectator for over 30 years until he launched his own platform. Yes, a lot of people say the scores are a little bit high. For me personally, I usually subtract two to three points. However, I do notice when he goes above 95 points, the wines are pretty darn good. Jeb Dunnick was actually the lead critic at Robert Parker's The Wine Advocate years ago. He branched off and started his own site called jebdunnick.com. In the beginning, he focused on wines from Washington, Santa Barbara County, Napa, Bordeaux, and the Rhone. One caveat on the wine scored by Jeb Dunnick, he gave it 97 and 99 points because it was tasting of a barrel sample, three point spread in terms of a score. Maybe that might be the real way to score all types of wines because wines change depending on the mood you're in, depending on how the wine shows, depending on different aromas in the room, even with the food you eat it with. Barrel sample scoring is controversial in its own right. What happens in the wine world is critics go and taste these wines before they're actually bottled, released, they're called barrel samples, and they usually give a three point spread in terms of a score to give leeway because the wine isn't finished yet. What a lot of people think is you're going in, you're using a thief to take a barrel sample. No, what happens is producers take out wines that are in the barrel, they blend them, they prepare a wine to present in front of critics. That blend isn't always 100% representative of what the finished wine will be. I taste a lot of barrel samples that go in the cellar, I also taste a lot of wines directly from the barrel. I tend to find that I enjoy wines directly from the barrel, especially with red wines because those wines aren't filtered yet. They just have a little more texture, a little bit of substance. When you filter, you find the wine, you take some of that stuff out. These wines are both made from the same grape. It's the same vintage. However, one is from the Southern Hemisphere, both from countries that have a history of producing great wine. Let's get it. Tasting with some wines with some serious aromatics. So I'm using my Rolf Sia glasses. These are the best inexpensive wine glasses I've ever used. I have a link in the description. Check them out. Helps the channel if you purchase with that link. So thank you. These are burgundy glasses, but man, I feel like they're going to work really well with these wines. I Coravin these, had somebody mix them up for me. Let's get going. These are two very pedigreed wines, not cheap whatsoever. In the past, before I knew much about wine, I always thought, oh my I want to taste a 99 point wine. I want to taste a 100 point wine. As you get more and more in the industry, you taste a lot of these wines. Sometimes you're disappointed with them. And then oftentimes how good a wine is is dependent on the company you're with. So I think they still should be good regardless. It's the same grape. One of these wines has no new oak and the other one has all new oak. Wine one has a lot of black raspberry, mint, eucalyptus, just a touch of mocha, almost like a stemminess. It's really intense. It jumps right out of the glass here. Mm. 
On the palette, it's pretty round, it's pretty mouth coating, it's pretty dense, it's viscous, almost like heavy cream. But it's not overly cloying. This grape has a lot of acidity, has a lot of peppery notes as well. This wine is exceptionally good. To me, 99 points as of right now, not, not 99 points, but I think it's very good. Let's move on to wine two here, and then we'll compare. Wine two, the oak just jumps out at me. Have a little bit of bacon fat, meat red raspberry type flavors it doesn't feel as plush it feels a little bit more delicate so to speak mm. just a hint of that mocha the woods coming on pretty strong at this point in time wine two is extremely peppery extremely long and it's not as plush as plump as fruity as wine number one is let's try to go back to wine one Wine one is plump and fruity. This is the most enjoyable for, I think, a casual person to drink right now. But there's a lot of subtle nuances. There's a lot of length. I think for my palate, I prefer number two here, although not everybody's cup of tea. Oh, I just love like the bacon fat type flavor. The thing about these wines, the one on the right, the tannins bite a little bit more. They're a little bit grippy. Wine one, the talons are more plush. They kind of sit kind of nice and flush on the palate. I think as this wine ages, the fruit will kind of fall off a little bit. Things will start to shed and it will start to unveil some of its secrets. This right here, I kind of have a good idea what's going because it's got more tannins. Subtleness, the bacon fat type components are nice. What makes these wines that get tons of high scores a lot of times is ageability, concentration. Wine one has tons of concentration. Two does. This is more delicate. This wine one is just more plush and fruity. Wine two's more to my palate. Wine one's to gonna be, I think almost everybody's gonna enjoy this wine. Wine one's the type of wine where you throw it in front of somebody that doesn't know a ton about wine. You say it's a highly scored wine, they're gonna be really impressed. Wine two, somebody might be a little bit disappointed with it if they don't know a ton about wine. You have to have, want, desire, a little more nuance, which I want. Let's get to the reveal. Some pedigreed wines here. I'm not quite as high as 99 points, but again, the point scoring system is just completely opinion. Both of the critics are a little bit on the higher side for my taste, but I still think these are excellent wines. Right here, wine one, the most friendly. I am 94 plus on it. I think it is very, very good. It's a wine that would bring to a lot of people and enjoy. I'm gonna tell you right now, the grape is Syrah. <laughs> <laughs> so then you know, number one right here, which I think it is, I think this is from Down Under. Let's take a look, it is. This is the Penfold St. Henri Shiraz 2018, 159 bucks. It is kind of a step below the Grange. It's a multi-regional blend. It was first made in 1957, was kind of revived in 1990. St. Henri Shiraz is usually more approachable right out of the gate because they don't use any new oak. It's all large oak casks. I've actually preferred St. Henri to Grange, and a lot of critics have right on Premiere. I think just because it shows a little bit better right out of the gate. This got 99 points on jamesuckling.com. Let's see what it says. Romas are ripe blackberries, red plums, are fresh together with tobacco, young leather, earth, chocolate. I definitely got the mocha, coal smoke, and tarry accents. Effortless depth on the palate with summer berries framed in fine alabaster-like tannins that are underscored with discreet power, long and captivating. I do agree that the tannins were their coating alabaster like while being round i thought it was long round i didn't pick up the young leather the earth i did get the mocha just a touch of tobacco the blackberries definitely 99 points i think it's very good i think this was actually scored by nick stock who was reviewing wines for jamessuckling.com at the time i used to buy that wine and drink it a lot in singapore that wine's near and dear to my heart okay wine number two i'm 96 points on a lot of more subtlety more European palette, I assumed it was. This is from one of the homes of Syrah. You ready to see what it is? It's from the Northern Realm. Let's take a look here. This is the Guigo Chateau de Empuy Coat Roti 2018, 199 bucks. Doesn't really surprise me because usually Australian Shiraz is a little fruitier than French Syrah. Ooh, this has just a touch of Viognier co-fermented in it. Coat Roti, one of the legendary Appalachians places for Syrah in the Northern Rhone. It's a very steep slope. There's a highway that goes right by. I've driven past it before. It literally translates to roasted slope. There is some Viognier 
Disney in it technically. Marcel Guigal is the man responsible for reinvigorating the Appalachian because when he started to push it again, there were only I think 74 hectares of vines there. I think now they're over 200. Guigal's single vineyard goat rotis are super collectible. La Lalone, La Turque, and I can't remember the third one at the moment. It's off the top of my head. Oh, and La Moulin. That's the other single vineyard. <laughs> Pretty good wine, serious wine, bacon fat. That's what teed me off of the Northern Rhone. Let's see what Jeb Dunnock said on this wine. Comes from the seven single vineyards, seeing the same upbringing as the flagship the releases, those top single vineyard releases. Vivid purple hue, stunning aromatics of Cassis. Smoke game, I definitely get the bacon fat. Flowers, just a touch of, and subtle smoke. Espresso laced oak that's perfectly integrated, full bodied and has ripe polished tans and a great finish. I thought the tans were a little bit chewy, which reminds me of Northern Rhone Syrah. This is a wine that's not even close to showing its best. I've been doing this YouTube channel for about eight years. For the longest time, I was also writing. I'm writing a lot less. I think the highest score that I've ever given a wine is 99 points. That that was a vintage of Harlan Estate from Napa. Have you ever had a 99 point or a 100 point wine before? I'd love to hear. Drop it in the comments below. Thanks a lot. I'll see you soon.